That's where I really It's know. haunted. Yeah. You look you look like our friend um, that used to play in um, Wild Boy of Abra. Hello? Hello? Uh, greetings, everybody. Welcome to the first post-COVID or semi-post-COVID gathering of the Columbus Music Commission's Music Mondays. Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, tonight, we're going to kind of break a little bit from our normal past forms where we have people tell their entire life stories and kind of get down right into the nitty gritty of answering questions and trying to impart information that's useful. Um, so our moderator for the evening is the wonderful Randy Malloy, who's the owner and president of CD 92.9, a fixture in our music community. Let's hear it for Randy. If you haven't either been on our mailing list, use the QR code and get on our mailing list. And we're going to be initiating a bunch of new programs that we'll talk about later in the evening. But one of them will be we're going to sponsor in conjunction with CD90.9. Am I standing in the wrong place that I'm giving you a feedback? Or are you just, just don't flunky? Fall just don't fall off stage. Okay. I'm like, like, no, 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 no. I, I, I've been on stage before. So um, we're going to institute a series of all ages shows. So artists, no matter what their age, and audiences, no matter what their age, can get to play in a real environment and be able to have an audience come and see them and not get shut out because it's, they're underage. And that's, we're going to announce those later. But let me just uh, shut up and give this to Randy and start the evening off. So, hi, I'm Randy Malloy with CD 101. I mean, CD1025. I mean, CD929. It's one of those things. We'll figure it out eventually. It's only been 30 years. Um, all right, so tonight we're going to try something a little different. We took the business out, and it's just Music Mondays by the Music Commission. And um, we've kind of talked, and we wanted to do things that were a little practical. Um, instead of having, you know, old guys get up here and postulate about what a great success they were, and how they got to where they were, and blah, blah, nobody really cares. Um, we want to try and give some practical information. So who here is in an actual band? Good, that's perfect. So tonight, it's two parts, okay? We're gonna start the first part, it's gonna be with these fine gentlemen, so this is interactive, you get to ask lots of questions, all right? And then the second part is a guy that signs bands. These guys book bands. So if you don't know, on the end is Tim Eddings. Tim is with Celebrity Etc. He books a bunch of venues here in town, including Scully's, the Athenaeum, he owns Rumba, and he does stuff at Natalie's on occasion. Next to him is Ian Baldwin. Ian works for Bravo Artists. Right. Now, Ian's out of Dayton and Cincinnati, but they also have stuff in Cleveland and Columbus. Now, that I actually had to write down the list because it is a lot of clubs and bars and venues and everywhere else so that one goes from Mahal's, the Agora, the Foundry, Beachwood Ballroom, now that's class, Grog Shop, Big Room Bar, Ace of Cups, Scully's, Rumba, King of Clubs, Donato's, Basement, Double Happiness, Legends, 20th Century Theater, and Brightside. So, a lot. And then next to me is Britton Dove. Britton works for AEG, and he actually books for the A&R Bar and the Basement. And he's been doing that for quite some time. So I know these guys pretty well. We actually, Knox Fields was supposed to be here tonight, but actually I made Knox work because I own a bar too called The Big Room and he's actually doing a show tonight. Yeah. So he left us a couple of notes that I'll share at the end. But we want to start with you guys asking questions about exactly, and these guys telling you the practical things you want to know of how the hell do I get booked? So, T 
Tim, why don't you start? How do bands actually get booked? Um, well, you... I don't know. <laughs> well, do they have to... No, well, uh, do they ask you? Do they send an email? Do they knock on the door? Do they send you a CD? The thing that works with us is email. Um, if you send us a text or a Facebook message, or those things work as well, but we will tell you to then email because we are massively, massively understaffed and overworked. And if we don't have folders to kind of sort what happened, then it's as if like, it's like literally the equivalent of like writing your name down on a piece of paper and then crumpling it up and asking a drunk person to stick it in their pocket. Like maybe they'll find it later and call you, but probably not. So, but when you reach out, the things to, to keep in mind are that we want to create win-win scenarios. For us, we don't have any built-in audience. Like, like Rumba, for example, is the baseline. We, it looks like a neighborhood bar and it feels like a neighborhood bar, but we only open for ticketed shows. And a $5 local show is a ticketed show. That's, you know, you pay five bucks to support your friends' bands and you do that. But if we don't have, we um, had a band cancel on Saturday night and we were closed on Saturday night because we're just not a neighborhood bar. That's so the same with Brightside. Yeah. And Dayton too. They, they're only open for weddings and shows. Yeah, well, there, there you go. Yeah. So, like, the Big idea open for shows only. So, the idea, the flip side of that, though, is we don't have any built in audience. Like, we, we don't have anyone that just comes in and walks in and plops down five or ten bucks to see who might be playing tonight. And we change genres a lot. So, we rely heavily on people making their shows a big deal. And especially at the local level, the good news and bad news is more of promotion falls on the artist. Then it, I'm, I'm old. And when I started, like if you played the right venue, you got a lot more people. Um, and if you played with the right promoter, you got a lot more people. These days, I'm, my talents on promoting shows have kind of made me a dinosaur. I, if we do a great job, a great job on a show, we add like 20%. You know, the people, bands, because of social media, the good news and bad news is that it, you have more of the power yourselves to connect with your fans, to know where your fans are, and to invite them to things. Um, the bad news is that that means that more of the work is on your side. So for us, we're just looking for someone who's good that can get some people out. Um, if you're really, really good, I mean, going to be the next big thing good, then occasionally we'll have a spot for somebody that can't get 20 of their friends out. But that's pretty rare. Like for the most part, we're looking for a combination of you bringing your peeps to the show. I just used the word peeps in a sentence because I'm old. It's Easter. <laughs> uh, but we're looking for the combination of, of doing that along with um, hoping that the other bands that are playing will also get some people to come out to the show and you can win some new fans over that way. But we need everybody to kind of do their part. So like if you don't draw anybody, don't email us unless you're the best new band in the world. So now should they contact you once, twice, 10 times? Where does it become annoying? Uh, no, I mean, the, the more is... Can I interject really it, quick, yeah. if that's okay? So I used to be in a band in Canton, Ohio, uh, called Abide in Me, and we, I got us on, like, it's, it was not impressive. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm we, from was, Canton, there's no chance we didn't blow them off, so now this is going to be I'm awkward. I'm sure I emailed you once, and you, <laughs> on MySpace, and you didn't say anything back, so. Sorry. I just had to throw you under the bus really quick. <laughs> You look, you look good for being oh. on MySpace. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, but I would email festivals that were happening, follow up in like two weeks. You never know if like one of the bands will drop off. So I think it, in my experience, following up in a week or two, even if you don't get a reply, can sometimes be that, worth that, doing. That's super helpful, but even, absolutely, even more so having a plan. Yeah. 
Like literally, I want my right now. Like in my email, there are hundreds of emails to get through, and there's going to be a few from local bands that want to be able to show, and so and some of them are going to be like, "Hey, we just started a band, and as soon as we find a drummer, can you put us on a show sometime?" Been there. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. That that's actually happened more than once. Um, the idea, but if you say, "Hey," these are three shows we feel like we might be able to get 20 people out for or hey we'd like to put a local show together do you have any available dates mm -hmm. like that's something you can respond because that gives us an action item to respond to and we literally look at the calendar and respond because my job like we want to support local music but the thing that i'm desperately trying to do even as we speak is fill our calendar and fill missing spots i think like doing your homework too and looking to see what genres you might pair well with or a band that you're excited about and you want to help them bring a crowd if they're not from here right you know it's going to be beneficial for you to be on the show and you can always reach out to that band's agent and be like hey we're so and so from columbus this is the number of people that we typically draw at this venue. We love this band and would love to help make their show a su success. Is that like overstepping like past yeah, the yeah. promoter in a way? Or is that, Britain, jump in here. That? Because now you book a lot of national bands, so. We do, yeah. You know, so sure. how do you get a local band, how do they get on that tour? Because they want to open right. for Frank Turner. Sure. Yeah. So they want to open for. We're in like a little bit different scenario where we're looking for support for some shows that aren't carrying, but a lot of the time we aren't. So a lot of the time it is a no. And so I would say do not be discouraged by the no's because I have to say it a lot. And I will say, I know you guys like email is like a preferred method. I mean, like if you call me, I'm probably not going to be near my phone at work anyways. And if you send an email, there's just, there's a ton of emails, like hundreds of emails in the inbox. So like, yeah, even that doesn't help. I would say, honestly, come to shows. Like I don't get to get out and see you guys perform as much as I want to, cause I'm at the venue, you know? Um, so come to shows, come say hi to everyone that you can meet. Do you think a weeknight or a weekend night's better to like run into you at a show? So just depend. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it does. I'm, I feel it's like I'm kind of a there, case by so. case basis, almost every show. Yeah, just go to everything. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Come, yeah, um, come to shows, meet people. You know, meet my sound engineers, get to know them, get to know the loaders and the front door people, and then, you know, let's have a conversation. It's it, it's really as easy as knowing your numbers. Like you guys all make great music. We try and listen to everything. We can't know what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. That's like the best thing I can do. Know how many people you're going to bring to the show, and then. Just tell us, make us an offer we can't refuse. You know, it is, it's the music business. Just tell us what's gonna work for you and what's gonna work for us and let's do it together. Mm -hmm. That's the best advice I could give. So one of my notes on the bottom that I was gonna bring up is go to shows and meet people. No one will care about your band if you're not active within your own community. Take flyers to shows, make friends with the venue staff and other bands. When I um, first started promoting since you know, my background is playing a drum, playing a drum, drums in a band, <laughs> and like a pop punk band. I was terrified of promoting for other bands in a way because it's like I was like kind of a fanboy in a way, but I would like have those bands like give them flyers to pass out, but I would also be doing that too at other shows close to the venue I was going to be having them perform at. Yeah. Questions, comments, concerns, mm -hmm. go. Oh, 100%. Be a fan yeah. Well, I wasn't embarrassed, but <laughs> <laughs> I embarrassed myself in other ways for sure. <laughs> but yeah. So it sounds like email is better than calling uh -huh. and showing up in person is better than emailing. Now, what's the practicality, though, if you're in a different city and you don't have the availability to do that? Mm. Like, do you have friends in, in other bands that are from that city? Use, use your, your network, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't know every band in Columbus, but I know a lot of people that know more than I do, and I talk to them. So do the same. To, to be more specific, just to expand on what he's saying is, we do not book out-of-town bands as openers. Not because we don't want to, we can't afford to. Like, generally, we, 
for most shows, not all, but probably 80, 90% of our shows, this is the 2021 where our national acts all need a little help, you know, because there's a zillion bands and they all draw less people. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for somebody to draw, not rock star numbers, but bring 20 to, you know, depending on the show, like sometimes it's 15 people, sometimes it's 50 people, depending on what it is, but you're looking for help with the draw. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of asking a band from out of town to put them on an opening spot for a national act doesn't work because you're, it's a negative because you, we, we want to give the band at least a hundred bucks or something for gas money. And then on the other side of it, you didn't get any ticket sales because they don't know anyone in town. Now, the other side of that is if you, we don't book the local openers for headlining local shows because I would rather like work with the IRS or negotiate a record deal <laughs> than negotiate money between local bands. <laughs> a lot of the times, <laughs> yeah. I think we were actually gonna do a show together for Champion Electric yeah. right before COVID happened. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I remember emailing you, we were just kind of like, cause I was like managing them briefly. Yeah. yeah. Didn't continue. Your They're friends, broken up. Friend. Yeah. Look them up, they're a great band. But yeah. um, just like, having that conversation about, okay, what bands do you guys know? What bands do you want on this show? Right. Kind of giving the headliner, the local headliner, the power to like decide and help. Yeah, ab absolutely. The show. Like so. we want, yeah, we want local headliners to deal with that because then they're, you know, responsible with each other. But for out of town bands to circle back to the original point, sorry if that was too much context, <laughs> but to circle back to the original point of what Randy w was saying is if you want to get an out of town show, the, the most important thing you can do is draw 100 people in your own town and then strategically figure out how to trade that with somebody that draws 100 people in their town. So because, collaborate. Yeah, show absolutely. So bring, so bring a show as opposed to a band, bring three bands. Yeah. Now you have a show for the evening. Yeah, Abs absolutely. Like, is it, that's the way our locals book, like, um, you know, our, our locals book their own support bands anyway and if you can get to the place where you draw enough people where you can sacrifice one of those spots to get a good out of town show that's the best way to do it so if you're trying to book out of town the best thing you can do is to reach out to bands in that town as opposed to reaching out to venues in that town because mm -hmm. they, they'll usually have an established relationship right with the venue well, yeah they had a question i just had a question No, but here's the thing to understand. Um, the, the, unless you're the best new band in the world, if you're just like really good or even like pretty good and you send us your EPK, but you can't draw 15 or 20 people, like if you don't have any friends. David has friends. I'm friends with him. Right. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm speaking to right, right, broad. The, EP, uh, yeah, the, EP, yeah, broad. the EPK yeah. thing as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know that you're good because that just makes me sad because I can't like I we can do. And please don't say that we don't support locals that don't draw, etc. We do, but we can only do it a couple of times a month or it's we're not trying a, to create win win situations for everyone. Yeah. So like I think one of the things when I was in a band that was very discouraging was if I didn't get a response, a lot of the times it would be because I would write a novel and I would send a novel to the promoter or the booking agent, try to condense it down to bullet points and having like a strategy and what you can bring to the table and just giving an average of like what your draw is. And so what would you say is like a good proof of like proving you have the audience or proving well, you honestly have local if, if, if you're not terrible and you're local i'll just find a weekday that hasn't been booked yet where the expectations are low mm -hmm. and you know and see what you do with it so you're basically throwing them a bone yeah like and saying like, hey yeah play put, a, this. Put, put a show together on this yeah. unfilled tuesday night and here's the thing you say well it's harder to get people on tuesday one that's not necessarily true because on Saturday in Columbus, Ohio, you're competing with a thousand events. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, you're competing with Netflix and you're going to have to win that battle eventually. 
If you can bring a hundred people on a Tuesday, you're golden. Yeah, for like, him, you have I, proved I need, like, everything 40. to me. <laughs> his his memories are a bigger deal. Ian, what is a win-win? Um, it's when I don't lose money. Ah. So like, I lose money. I have lost a lot of money booking my first couple shows. I was pretty naive and didn't pay myself the first year or two, and it was because I knew, you know, just being in a band, how difficult it is to like get paid, get the gas money, but you have to be, you have to know your worth and you have to like put it out there and say exactly what you need to play the show. Because if you go to the show and you can't get home, they're not gonna pay you if you didn't bring the people. So you just have to know what you need and just have clear and transparent communication when you're booking. No, and even beyond, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Guy in the back first. Yeah. I don't know if I need it, I can be pretty loud here. But uh, for those who are booking multiple venues, if we submit to a venue, uh, are, we, is, are, are we considered for the, that roster of, menu, or menus, of venues, or is it just for that one that we asked for? Uh, you're considered for all of them, but generally, like the base bands, I mean, there's exceptions, but. Uh, generally, bands that are playing at Rumba are playing at the basement, mm -hmm. but are more likely to not have opening bands. And How does a band know if there's an open spot on a bill? Because well, a lot of the times, Bravo will announce the tour or the show, and I know you guys will too, but like, how do you know like, if there's a spot open? Oh, you just ask. I mean, literally, I don't have a problem with the email that says, hey, are there any local opening spots on this? You don't have to write mm -hmm. the whole novel. It's like... and. Most of the time, the, the answer is no, but, but we do have spots where they, they're, but that doesn't mean like occasionally um, we'll have someone between festivals at the Athenaeum that needs a local opener. Mm -hmm. and that you being know? said, if you see two openers on the show, we probably don't need an right. opener for that show. And you can sweeten the deal. Be like, hey, I see this band's coming through. We could probably bring 50 people to this show. And then it's like, okay, now that's worth an extra 50 tickets. This makes more sense. Let's think about this, and then you can we can pitch that Your to the partner. agent or the manager and be like, "They're worth fifty tickets. What do you think?" Right. Mr. Gabor Klein, take the microphone. One question. Right there. Uh, one part question is um, that I used to go to rumba all the time, and I didn't care who was playing. And the rumba used God to be... God bless you. Well, <laughs> so Thank did, you. So did everyone else. The rumba was a destination spot. And uh, I don't know why exactly you think that people won't go to bar. That's a neighborhood bar. That's well, one... Well... I usually go to bed at 8 if I'm not working a show. Well, <laughs> no. I mean, so. the, in the transition, we're, we're talking about... Rumba has made this, it's still beloved among local musicians, but we do a lot of weekday national act shows and some weekends where, where the ticket prices are between 10 and $25. And you don't get a lot of, like, the $10 thing, there are, there are a few people, so, wonderful people. So, that Tim, were, you eliminated a local venue to make a ticket a venue. You well, about, about nine years ago, Rumba came to, to us to try and get, they weren't, they needed numbers. <laughs> they needed more people to come. And they approached us about trying to do concerts there. We, we still do a crazy number of local shows every year, but we also do national ticketed shows as well. Okay. There's, um, I, what's your other question, Gabor? The other question I have is what about the bands and the music? We're hearing about ticket sales and making money, and we're not hearing about the bands and the music. Well, in response to that, and that's, that's absolutely a fair question, all music, we don't want to skip past the fact that none of us on this stage would be doing this if we didn't love music. Like, rock and roll is not a good mechanism to get rich. It's just 100%. not. I yeah. don't have Unless a house, and pilots. I also well, work a day job. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> so. no, yeah, no. But having said that, what the question that we're answering is how to get booked, 
And the answer for that is we do have a couple of spots a month that are just literally about the, probably more than a couple of spots a month. But, and you know, for, we have, we, between our venues, we have a couple hundred bands play every month. And we have a handful of spots where we don't need somebody to draw anyone where we can stay open if those bands don't draw anyone. What? So those go to the best of the best, but it's a little, or to the people that we have a relationship that we're trying to help develop. But, but for strangers, just even for hundreds of strangers, right. emailing is very in. very big, very yeah, big. Right, but for hundreds of strangers emailing in, you can't give that kind of support to every band that emails you because you won't be there anymore to support anybody. Well, so the, the question that we're trying to answer is, to the bands that we don't know and that may not be one of the best new bands in the world but are playing something that's worthwhile, how do you get booked? And the answer to that is, well, we care about the music. And, and one of those things too is I would rather have a great band that draws 15 people than a band that has 50 friends that's gonna drive people out of the room. You know, we're, there is, music absolutely is the reason that we're all here, mm -hmm. but we do need to get some people out as well. So that, that's the, the, the answer to that question. But we care about the music for sure, or else we wouldn't be here right now. I think well, too, I, many venues, uh, I'm, I'm only 32, so like, I don't know, I'm a baby compared to a lot of people here. Um, he's saying I'm old. He's saying I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but growing up, I used to go to skate parks and like church venues. The first couple shows I booked were at a church. They just want people in the building for, you know, whatever reason they want people in their building. <laughs> just like everyone else. It's a every, every building has a purpose. And if you can find a way to maximize that purpose and you can bring a, a case to why you need to play this room, Tim's going to book you. Well, I mean, look, let's be realistic. Um, rock and roll has to make money for all participants. That's the win-win. The venue has to make money. The band has to make money. You know, I look at it pragmatically when we do shows at the big room that, you know, I've said this as someone before I owned the bar and still say it, and I've said it about venues, what you lose at the door you make on the floor. So if a venue, and I always use an example of a venue that's here in Columbus, I won't mention it, but a venue books a band <coughs> and they sell... 25 tickets, and the average drinker that night is going to drink $10. That bar is going to make $250 that night. Now, they've got fixed expenses. They've got to have the manager and the sound guy and the door guy and the bouncer and the cleanup guy and everything else. Now, if they paper that show and they give away 100 tickets, now that venue has how many more people staying in it? Another 100 people drinking. If they're spending an average of $10 a head, now they've got 1,000 people, you know, $1,000, 1,250 is their dollars. So the venue isn't gonna care so much about what your ticket price is or what your cost is. They're gonna care about how much money is the bar getting and do you draw numbers? Mm -hmm. So if you're charging $15 versus five or a free show and you get the numbers in there, they'll forego whatever it is because if you put 100 people in a small venue, that's going to make that bar money that night. And they're going to look at you and be like, wow, these guys draw, I want them back. They're, so come back with another band or come back on your own. Yeah. I, I have one more thing I want to say. Okay. And that is that I managed bands for 40 years and uh, 20 bands. And I always made sure that the bands were in charge of their future and their um, and I didn't depend on the promoters and we worked with everybody but it was the bands that I, I made sure that the bands kept their own um, identity and they kept their own um, well they had to self promote I mean that's you know one of the things that again I have on my note is, post about your shows regularly. Make the venue a co-host. Promotion is everyone's job. The promoter just takes the financial risk to help to make sure everybody makes some money. Okay. So that's sort of that you as the band have to be responsible for your own promotion. If you aren't a marketer, someone in your band should be. And if not, then again, find a friend who is a marketer and market yourself. Learn how to use social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, or Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok or 
whatever you use. I just got on TikTok this past week, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> quick I'm. And he's 32. I, you have to. Too old. Yeah, I told you. But you really do have to get out of your comfort zone when promoting your own sh shows and emailing promoters, agents, venues. They're putting themselves out there as well, and everyone's taking a risk, whether it be financial or, you know, being on stage. I, I'm terrified to be up here because <laughs> I, I haven't been on stage in two years. I'm so for national acts, Britain Dove, you guys can use something called Polestar, right? Yeah. Polestar, and what does that do? It gives us the information of, you know, a band's on tour, this is how many tickets they average, this is what they've done the last five years. It's just metrics, it's a great tool. I kind of, I want to touch back on what about the artists, what about the music? Um, I think that's the win-win that we were kind of talking about, but we kind of missed it, is that the band knows what they're doing when they walk in and we take care of them financially and you know like we do we give them towels and waters and we do all the things but then they gotta play and that magic in the bottle of a local band selling out the basement for the first time that's why i love this job it's mm -hmm. it's a fantastic feeling to see someone put in all the hard work and then it pays off that's that's what we're looking for we want bands to know what they're worth and show us and then we all get to go have a great night afterwards that's that's the important part to me It's <laughs> well, this is, this is fun. So Stephanie is here in the audience tonight, and Ooh. she, I'm just going to say this, Stephanie, and they, they do it a, a very, like a very methodical way. Um, they've proven that they can move tickets. And so, it's, I'm, and they're good. You know what I mean? This, this is the win-win dream scenario. They're, they're, they're a relentless promoter. They self-promote relentlessly. And I mean, that's the bottom line right there. I mean, they self-promote. Stephanie is a momager. She works the crowd and she does a really good job at it and makes herself known. So that helps and that gets people talking. And when people are talking, well, what's all the buzz? We need to go see this band. So that's again, creating that. You know, the story of Marilyn Manson, I always love. Marilyn Manson didn't have a band, he promoted himself, and then when he sold out a show, he put a band together. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of, you know, creating the hype. You create your own hype, you're your own story. You know, you're your own promoter. You have to believe your own hype, honestly. It's, I mean, as much as it is a business and a job for us, it is for you guys too. So like, taking control of it and going and getting it, that's, that's how you do it, really. Um, oh. Question over there. Hey, hi. Microphone. Drink down. I need a drink holder. Hi, I'm Carla with Victorious K-Birds. Um, first, I want to thank you for saying that about if you sell something other than tickets, because all my fans are rich, and they, you know, just kidding. But, you know, they come in and they spend $50, not $10 on a drink. So does that make a difference when you know that the, the following is going to be actually buying food oh, absolutely. drinks, food drinks? I mean, again, if you, you know that you have an adult audience that's going to bring in, you know, more money for the bar, obviously the promoter is going to be talking to the bar owner and or the manager, and that's going to have absolutely okay. going to influence decisions. So I'm just... Mm -hmm piggybacking on what you said because that's a good point my real question is how much does genre matter because many of us are genre fluid and how much does I don't know how to put this what we charge or what we hope to charge matter when you're booking I'll say for genre zero I don't care if it's heavy metal reggae lo-fi hip-hop shoegazy doesn't matter if you draw a crowd that's what I care about and the ticket price is basically going to be on your audience. 
I mean, if you're charging $50 and people come, great. If you're charging five and people come, great. Again, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not in it for the door. That's where the band makes their money. It's sort of, you sell your merchandise, you sell your tickets, you keep that. Mr. Britton? Yeah. You had a question that's, as well. Same that's thing, all right. genre, do you care about genre? I don't care about genre, I care about music and people coming and seeing good music. That's really, that's it. Ian? As far as genres? Genre, um, ticket price? I think mixing genres is great. I mean, like you were saying, just being genre fluid, I think everyone defines and is influenced by what they grew up listening to, what their parents But I mean, at a, at a venue, to, as a promoter, yeah. do you care? No, as long as I like the music. But yeah. I also try to book what I'm interested in mostly first and then, you know, look for opportunities to partner with people that work hard. I booked an EDM artist in Dayton, 18-year-old kid that went to school with my brother. He sold 40 tickets in like two weeks. That's amazing. And he reached out to me. We sat down and had a conversation. We got coffee um, in Dayton. And he told me exactly what he wanted to do. And we made it happen. And you just really, like, I don't go to EDM shows, but like I see the value that he's bringing out. He's having, you know, like he's creating a great time for people. He's creating a party, you know, for people to come enjoy and um, be there. So you have to, I think the term show and concert, like those get thrown around a lot. You really have to think of it as an event. Uh, absolutely. Uh, genre and ticket price. Tim, go. Oh, yeah. I, I, had a I, I, I had a question. Just genre and ticket place, real quick. The answer is if I don't care if we mix genres, as long as the opener's genres isn't going to make the headliner's fans want to leave the room. That's a great point. And vice versa. If, like, the local bands, there's, there's, and I want to get into this a little bit more for a second. It's not real long, but not at this exact second. Conflating all local artists together isn't fair because music does have value. Music has value if, you know, art has value that isn't necessarily directly related to commerce. Like it can be that expression of yourself that you just need to get something out and you, and you may not be able to sell it. It doesn't mean that it's not important. Mm -hmm. it, we may only be able to support that so much but we try to support it when we can because we're all suckers for people that like do something that's like honest and sincere, et cetera. But there is a huge difference in how you market. Randy made some good points about like blowing everything up as far as brand, you know, making sure that you're out on your socials, doing everything. It, that helps in a way it may not, for some bands that, that really only helps their brand. It doesn't help them move individual tickets unless they invite people individually. I think too. Um, oh, just okay. Just let, let yeah. me let me yeah. finish because I want to want to be annoying and get it over with. Um, it, hold the thought though. I am. I am. Okay. the The thing though that you need to understand, and this is important from minute one, uh, is there's a threshold of whether or not strangers are paying to see you. And that doesn't mean that your music is irrelevant if they aren't. But how you market it and how you approach getting shows matters whether or not, like, you know, Kenzie sitting in the front row and Hello Luna does have people that pay 10 bucks that don't know who they, don't know them personally. I mean, they may, may have met them at a show, but they heard them open for somebody and they've decided that they're worth going to spend $10 again how you market that as opposed to the band that like works their ass off in the basement a pretty 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 good set together but hasn't necessarily inspired a, a bunch of strangers to go buy your music doesn't mean that what you're doing isn't valuable but how you approach getting shows is different and how you approach marketing those shows is different you should still do the brand stuff but you're probably going to have to like text people and say hey you know, we're doing this thing. Can you come out? Because we're really trying to get 20 people out because we want them to book us again, if that makes any sense. And knowing where you're at, and by the way, that's a fluid situation because bands get better. You know, there, there may be a point where you start and it's just your friends and family 
and then eventually like you practice and you work and you de- hone your craft at the point where strangers are coming out later but you kind of need to know where you're at and how the best way to go but so I, I hope that a makes- little bit of self-awareness too like it's hard to look at yourself or your band and try to look at it from a business standpoint and lens and i know because i've done it like it's not fun to look at the numbers and see like how much are you setting aside for xyz for getting your music recorded or playing a show well, well to be fair and i think that's where the breakdown and you get so much like trolling on awful social media I don't necessarily think that you need to think of it as a business if you're just trying to express something cool in your basement and you want to go have some fun and you want to play. Like, you don't need to think of that as a business. But understand that, like, we're trying to run businesses. So you just have to figure out a place where, like, hey, that's the point where the music needing to be able to bring 20 or 30 people out does matter because that helps us out. And hopefully you get to be a part of something cool. And it should feel like a win-win at the end, or else we're, we haven't Done served you well. Yeah. But that, but 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 that's the thing is like it's one of those things that's like when we have like somebody that promises forty tickets to get a show, like they're we're like we're really going to be good for forty people, and you know pick us over these other nine bands, and we need like those people to like make the show break even that night, and then the band decides to like c- cancel like. 12 hours beforehand for no good reason. I, I, Uber driving was my favorite excuse. For All right, like, so that brings me to a point then. So do's and don'ts. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I'm just saying like it's that thing of like don't. Don't yeah, inflate like, your numbers yeah. just to try to make yourself look better than you really are. And Well, yeah, I, I was actually just talking about like it's the, it's the hot things where like somebody somebody's like hobby and passion is like inner is connect cross connecting with a business so it's like how those two things interact like keep be self-aware like he was saying sorry no you're fine uh thank you so much um so my name is gino i play in two bands in town uh thomas and the workman in wyoming and it's great to have you guys here because when you guys respond to our emails it's like the best day ever for me um so i just we gave you a weekend yeah, thank you. That was my question. So, like, I guess it, we talked about, like, email is the best way to contact you, but I'm curious about, like, you know, how, mu- how far in advance should we be contacting you, especially if we're, like, competing for, like, a Friday or a Saturday? Um, how much time do you need? How much time do you need? And then are you – because How much well, time do you need? You know what I mean? Well, so, like – Like, if, if what, the show was in two weeks. Yeah. Could well, you do it? it? So, I wouldn't, like – I, if I hit you up for like a show like in December, I would imagine that those are already booked, especially Friday or Saturday. And the market is super saturated right now. Everyone wants shows. So I'm like, should, should I be booking out like six to eight months in advance? And then likely I might get hit back with like, uh, I'll give you a third or fourth hold. So that was gonna be another question is like, what do you do in that scenario? Like Britain, if I hit you up and you give me like a third hold, should I be like, hey Tim, you know, do you have this date available? And I'm, asking a lot of questions I'm sorry That's but like another one kind of in that field is should I give you a specific date like hey I want December 13th or should I see what's available like a range of dates yeah like a preferred. lot of times for me it's like trial and error it's like I gave Rumba Cafe a specific date and I was confident about it and they booked it or you know I'm talking with Britain we're going back you know well on the back and forth to be clear I think we came back and said that might work what are your availability on these three i think we had three weekends in november that hadn't confirmed yet like for us we if you it depends on what you draw who you are like if you're gonna if you're a band that sells out the room you can book really far out if you're a good band that draws 50 people and want to build something we might have a weekend for you but we're probably not going to be able to confirm it till eight weeks out because we're gonna see, I mean, we had, you know, we're struggling and we were closed for 18 months, you know, we're trying to, to get a bunch of sellout shows, but we will try, We, if we believe in someone, we really wanna do their shows. Like we really do try to find dates for people. So like it being flexible and like starting that dialogue, you might start that dialogue three or four months out and say, hey, we wanna do an album release show in February and I will say, okay, I'm gonna put the, you on the calendar for everything right now. Tell me if there's any of these dates you can't do and let's try and confirm something so we can announce it in November. 
and then we'll figure out what we have then to make it work. That, I know that sounds all a little complicated, but it, that, that's kind of how it works on our side. As well, opposed all right, so let's, let's ask a few questions then. So how far out is the sweet spot for you? Three months. Say two to three months. Tim, uh, we we will confirm eight weeks out, like, but we would like to. You can contact three or four months out. So time. Yeah, I mean, three four months out, and then just give us a give but give us more than one option. All right, do's and don'ts. Give me some do's and don'ts that bands should do and bands shouldn't do. Britain, oh, both before and. Worse after like before a show and at a show i'll just be nice really like <laughs> we're all working a long time in those venues like 12 15 hour days sometimes we're just not feeling it like i feel like i've been in a funk the last couple months I, it's nothing personal it's just like just it, I, i'll you'll get the same respect that you put in just be nice people you know um outside of that just keep playing your instruments i can't play a lick of anything I'm very jealous of all of you. Keep playing your instruments. It's incredible what you guys are doing. Um, outside of that, I, I come back to me because I got some things. <laughs> Don't send me your Reverb Nation link because that website is useless. <laughs> um, sorry, that was a bad joke. Um, but, but yeah, seriously, send links that are relevant to your band. Send your best social media. Don't send every social media profile. Send the social media profile you have the strongest presence and interactions on, in my opinion, and have a website also. Can we assume that like, all, like, most town bookers are all of them are after Spotify, right? So, like, if they don't, I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, send music. Yeah. My goodness, yeah. send us music. I, because. I mean, I can't get to everything, so if I get it on my Send desk, I'm going to... a specific gonna... song, even. Absolutely. Yeah. And just check in with us, really. Like, it's business, but also, like, I'm friends with a lot of people in here, and it's... This is fun. You know what I mean? Keep me up to date. I get, like, all my friends hit me up, and they're like, can I get tickets to this? Can I get tickets to this? Just hearing, like, a friendly, hey, how you doing? Yeah. That goes a very long way. I promise. <laughs> There's a book by Adam Grant. It's called Givers and Takers. Give and take. Read it. There, you'll remove takers from your life much quicker than you think. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, you know, obviously I'm having the gross allergy attack and keep blowing my nose, but if I felt a little better, I would get on my knees and beg you to please only, if you really want to draw, Please just promote one show at a time. Please. Pretty please. Amen. Yellow hoodie. <laughs> You, you, the, the, it's like a, and this is, and I'm not faulting anyone that for believes this because the idea of playing a lot, there's sort of this Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, urban legend myth that that helps you get bigger. And that actually was true before social media existed. But now that, like, the idea is what you're acts unintentionally communicating is that it's not a big deal when we play because we always are playing. Scarcity of resources. Yeah, right? like there, there's no more similar product than you, the same band playing the same songs. Mm -hmm. So like the idea is, is you don't actually get bigger by playing a lot locally. You get bigger by making every local show special and making them a big deal. Now there are exceptions to that, like, like festivals that the $75 tickets or like there, or private events or things where you're not required to hustle and promote. But even then you have to watch to make sure song kick and bands in town aren't like alerting everybody to make your headlining show seem less special. But the, the, as much as you can, try to make it a big deal. And by the way, that's not just like we, we're not trying to be like dicks about like playing our own shows. Like we want, 
like we've hit a couple of three or four times this month we've asked bands that we love who are earnestly just trying to promote shows by the way we're not down on them that went into announce early and i'm like no you've got a show in an r bar please wait until after that show to announce your next show so, so the top thing i had on my so notes was don't overbook yourself overplaying the same market will eventually hurt your draw and make you less desirable to promoters and clubs scarcity of resources so if you aren't playing every weekend then oh my god i love that band when are they playing oh i can see him saturday or i can see him friday or i can see him thursday less desirable and oh, they haven't played in months they're playing a show in two weeks we should go see that yeah the the way to the best way that i've heard that explained is and this is counterintuitive because we're all music lovers and we probably consume more than most people do but, but especially if you're playing original music and especially if you're trying to get strangers to participate um people consume original music much the same way they consume movies like they're going you like I loved the the last Tim, Star Wars. Wind it up. Okay. I love that. I <laughs> All love right. that. Wind it up, buddy. I had, no. I had an example <laughs> earlier that I no no I was just gonna no no I was just gonna say that like e, e, people are gonna go, come see you ten times ever. If you spread it out, you can use that to build a bigger audience with those ten times. If you burn through it in six months, they might come to your next album release show. But those ten people still love you. They just aren't coming again. They, yep. they, they loved it. They saw it 10 times. They aren't going to come back unless it's really... I, I hope that makes sense. I felt like that was important. I'm sorry. All I right, think. questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Miss Stephanie, go ahead. Get a microphone or just yell. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you um, and to all of the bands and, that are in this room. Um, if what you're i mean if what you're doing every day and you wake up and you say oh my god i can't wait to do it again tomorrow don't stop because i mean we love what you're doing and so that's you know that's what is super exciting um randy since you're sitting Stephanie. up here i think it would be really important for you to to talk about the collaborations of when a band is getting ready to do a show um that and you're getting ready to promote it, thinking about those other partners as well. So like the radio stations and some of those other partners that can help. I mean, you're wanting to help promote you, but you're also helping the venues. You're helping, we're all in this, right? We're all in this to, together. So I think when I'm helping the bands that I'm helping, I'm always also thinking about the music, the radio stations, the other, the venue, what are those other things? So, I mean, kind of open your, you know, open your thoughts about, I'm not, you're just not in it for yourself, but also, I mean, because it's those relationships, right? You want to get your music on the radios, you want to get it out there. So really think about how can you help those that are sitting at this table too. So maybe talk a little bit about your relationship as a radio station with the venues too. I think it's well, the venues are easy. I mean, you know, basically the partnership we have with the venues is, that they want to have us promote, just as they want you know, social media or anything else. If we think about it, I always say that the radio station was the original social media, um, you know, because it's free, it's instantaneous, it's transportable. So it's just sort of, it sort of fills in with all of the stuff that we said, promoting yourself. It's just another asset for you as a band to use to get the word out. Um, so, you know, I think it's as important as anything else when it comes to how you promote yourself. You know, when I used to do promotions for bands, I did flyers. I used to literally staple flyers to telephone poles down on campus. You know, the telephone poles that used to catch on fire because they were so thick with flyers, but you had a staple gun, you just stapled onto other flyers. So it's all about the self-promotion. You know, you can't promote yourself enough and you can't over-promote yourself too little. So you just have to use whatever resource it is, whether it is the radio station, whether it is your social media, whether it is going to other shows and handing out flyers, hot cards on the windshields of cars at get, a club. Get creative. It's guerrilla marketing. Does um, everyone know Randy? <laughs> That's because he's everywhere. <laughs> he promotes himself. He does a damn good job at it, too. So he's giving you the best advice right there. I knew who Randy was before he knew who I was. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah. Um, 
something I wanted to mention was be creative about how you label yourselves as a genre. Like, make something up. Like, it's not interesting if you're just like, oh, I'm in a rock band. Like, are you in a funk rock band? Are you in like a, I don't know. Give me some examples. <laughs> right. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get yeah. wrapping up here because we're gonna have Palette Knife come play three songs, and so you guys will be able to do that in just a couple minutes. We're gonna get Palette Knife for a couple songs, and then we're gonna get Joe Urban up here, and he's gonna talk about how you actually get signed, and that's just important. One of the last things I wanted to bring up was this is another note from Knox that is important for you guys to know: learn how to set up and tear down quickly and efficiently. Most venues have a standard 15-minute changeover to get your band on. Be prepared to go on and get off just as quickly. So if you are your best own roadie, learn to be that. Did Knox specifically mention the drummer not breaking down on stage? He did not, but <laughs> maybe. Go, question. Right, well, sharing backline, sharing drum kits, sharing anything you can with other bands makes you efficient, makes it faster. Mm -hmm. And again, venues like that, tour managers like that, sound guys like that. But also protect your ears. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Like, Way in the back, question. I drink that shot for sure. We used to do that. I was gonna say, Brendan did that all the time. Yeah, we did that all the time. The, the weird thing is, I mean, we can talk about the bars, but like we we have a concessionaire that runs the bar now, so like we don't deal with the bar. Mm. Weird. Tim should do the shots, absolutely. You know, I think we're going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> if you know that a promoter or venue specializes in something and you have a contact at the venue and you have an idea for like a drink or like a special for the night that will incentivize people to come out, like even inviting a food truck out to the venue. Yeah, it doesn't that. just have just, to be booze. You have something to ask. different. You have to ask. Yeah. yeah. Final Thank thoughts, you. Tim. I, I, I used up all my words for the day. <laughs> Final thoughts, Ian. Uh, can, uh, can I take this one question from David and Go. Alex? They drove all the way from Dayton, by the way, take to be the here. And they're in a band called Life and Idol. Thank you so yeah. much. a band from Kansas that wants to yep. play date. Yes, absolutely. That's what you Make said. sure you take lots of pictures at your shows. Yeah. Yeah. Hire a videographer, photographer. Have absolutely. Yeah. Proof. Proof of concept. Thank you. Yeah. Bryn Dove, last words. Just play your instruments. Just practice. Seriously. Practice, like, you practice guys are, your craft. It's amazing. It's amazing what you're doing. Guys, thank you for paying attention. Appreciate you guys very much for being up here. All right, we're going to hear Palette Knife, then come right back. So we're going to have Joe Urban. He's going to tell you how to get signed.
All right, as you guys start to get settled, so the next guy that we're going to talk about, the first part of this was how to get booked. Now, the second part is how to get signed. So this is Joe Urban, this guy, and he's got local bands and bands signed, like Snarls and Solder Bomb and these guys, Palette Knife. Who else do you have? Uh, we work with Jetty Bone, Safe Face. Tell them, not me. Um, this thing on? It's on. You got to move right, it closer. Yeah. Got to move closer. There we go. <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, Jetty Bones from is from Columbus. Sonar Bomb Snarls. Uh, worked with bands like Safe Face, Super American, just bought a new record. We put out records from. Uh, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. There we go. Not the band. <laughs> yes. So we put out. 20, 30 bands over the past six years. Kind of doing it full time in Cleveland since 2017. And, you know, we signed Pal and I, we signed Sonder Bombs with the bassist over here, Cappy. Um, Snarls is a Columbus band. And we're really into just developing them from the ground up. And we have signed bands and, you know, tried to put them on tour. Put their records out on different physical mediums, whether it's vinyl, cassette, CDs, they're still popular, and we're trying to build a build their fan base that way in different. All right, so that's a, a pretty impressive list of bands, both here locally in Columbus and in the region. So how does a band find you? How do you find a band? How does a band get from we're playing shows, we're playing clubs, and now suddenly someone recognizes them and says, hey, these guys are good enough to actually have support. Because that means, like, when you get signed, what do they expect? You get a million dollars, right? They're rich suddenly, oh, yeah. and they got a tour bus, and all this happens, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every, every band is unique. Every situation of signing a band is very unique. Um, it's very piggybacking on what is with the, with the booking, like Sonder Bombs, uh, were a band that I saw in Cleveland at uh, first we put them on not Spring Fling what was it Cat Summer Bummer Summer Bummer 2018 2018 saw them play got the record a week later like this is gonna be great I under I understood that we had another band Future Teens who was touring like hey Future Teens doing a tour in January let Sonder Rams open let's do that another band Safe Face who's already further along the way hey Safe Face is doing a full US tour. Let's put Sonder Bombs on that tour. And then they, head, uh, they co-headlined Summer Bummer the next year, 2019, where Snarls played, the upstairs, a smaller room. Saw them play, it was like, they had a record done. This record is fantastic. I was, e like, Mick from Snarls sent me the record. This, I open every email, I listen to every band. Half of them are very bad, at least. But I listen to everything. And like the Snarls stuff, like, I listen to the record, I, texting or emailing through my phone. It's like live live texting, like going through songs, like how to sign that band. And then with a pal and knife, um, I was deep diving through like a website called Bandcamp, doing genre tagging, just doing research on stuff. And I saw that Mick from Snarls like Palette Knife. And I was like, what's the story? Tell me about this band. And they were putting out a record uh, in weeks. And I I think I texted uh, the band or just emailed the band immediately and said, hey, uh, you're doing this record, but uh, I have a better plan for you. <laughs> so here's the plan, and we worked something out. And those are just bands knowing each other, bands from the area, and it's just the serendipitous way of when like really good music speaks to me and I want to be not only you're working it, but you want to love it. Because if you don't love it, like getting a text from Willow at midnight on a tour is going to be like, why am I doing this? Because you're constantly working. I've, been, I've got seven texts, like 10 emails from bands that are on the road right now while this event. It's just, you got to love what you're doing. And the bands that you sign, whether they're small bands that you enjoy or larger bands that you're trying to make financially successful in different ways, there's pathways for everybody. Well, what's the advantage of them signing? So like with Sonder Bombs, it's touring. You know, we understood that they needed to get on the road. Their live act was great. They drew m hundreds of people in Cleveland. Um, what pathway do we have for that? Um, with Snarls, it was the same thing. Like they had a record, we got them a tour in two weeks. 
And that's not necessarily a label's job, but as a small independent label, I'm your manager, I'm your agent. I'm trying to find those people to take that job away from me because I don't want to do that. Um, and then just f also like distribution, paying for the vinyl, the recording, paying for your, you need merchandise. You're going on a tour like, hey, this band needs us to front you 100 shirts for this tour, here you go. You know, you're essentially like a bank with a marketing firm. That's what a label is. Or, you know, I want to have better relationships with my bands too though, where we can talk and be transparent because things do get messy as bands make more money and other people come into the mix, your manager, your agent, your lawyer. These are people I want in there, not to only keep like my work less, but to also keep the labels, like keep everyone in check. The manager is taking, you know, the manager wants this and the label wants that, but ultimately we want to work together to get what is best for the band. So again, it sounds like the reason that someone would want to sign up is that it is exponentially easier because now they've got more support. So some financial, it sounds yep. like, as well as help with management and as well as help with marketing and what else? Um, like we have in-house people at the label who we handle all the distribution as far as like your digital distribution, we're getting on better playlists like the Spotify, Apple world. We work directly with ADA, which is a part of Warner. So that is helpful. We get your records in stores, you're on tour, you're playing Chicago, we want you in that Chicago record store. I mean, the past two years, it's been a little weird, but normally that's how would, you know, you'd go with it. Uh, also, you know, we have in-house art person, you need art, like Palette Knife, great asset of that band is they know exactly what they want for art. They know exactly how they want to design it. They're, outlook on everything. Not every band is like that. You need to push and pull and work and to develop their branding. You know, it's the evil branding word, but it's very important. In social media, sometimes you need to kick people like, hey, you just put out an album. Let's, let's figure out what to do. Like, do we need live shows? Like an audio tree, there's live sessions. Or you need to do, hey, let's do a music video. Or like, what can we do to keep this album live? Like, do we need another single here? Or are you just going to work on the next album? Like, as someone who's been in doing, like, I've been in bands, I've worked at recording studios, I've booked shows. So understanding all the infrastructure and what's going on, the asset of signing to me is that I'm able to understand when to pivot to different things. Fair enough. So what's the number one way that you find these artists? I... I Heard that you use this sort of collaborative effort that Palette Knife Solder Bomb, but do you, are you your own A&R person or do you have other people that sort of point bands in your direction or do you get pointed in bands' directions? It, it varies a ton. Sometimes I'm just deep diving and looking for bands that are similar on Spotify or you're going through Bandcamp genre tags. Other, other times some agent or, or manager or lawyer will reach out to me like, hey, what do you think of this band? Do you want to team up and do this? You know, being at a point now as a label who's done multiple bands and had some success with it, these people want to work together to team up. And it's like, hey, this agent will pick you up. We'll put them on this tour. We'll do, we'll do it together. It's, you know, it's uh, pretty serendipitous in how things come together. And the, in music, it just happens really fast. More often than not, like everything's lightning in a bottle and how you take that and what you do with it is the hardest part. Anyone can be the flash in the pan for six months, but developing a band to have a career is the hardest thing to do. You mean everyone doesn't become the Rolling Stones? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Anybody question before we, before we go for it? Go ahead. Yeah, we worked with uh, Jonathan, with They, Them, Us on the film. Uh, Jonathan reached out for one of the bands, and we ended up pitching him five, which is probably a lot. And it worked out, you know, watched the movie, took some suggestions, dove in. Um, he's worked with, you know, b bands that are universal on the film, and like, how do we deal with the licensing? Now, as a label, independent label, the publishing deal, this is probably for a whole other conference, but the publishing and the master ownership are two totally different things. And as a, as a small independent label, that publishing is all your stuff. So your radio play, 
the pu that publishing money is the bands. When you're in a movie, that publishing side is the bands. It's essentially 200% business, 100% master usage, 100% publishing, which is the song itself. Uh, that is an antiquated way of putting it, but essentially that's a whole other revenue stream for bands that most bands don't even tap into. Like you're on an H&M playlist, or I'm not sure, I'm from Massachusetts, whatever department store in Ohio there is. <laughs> so, yeah, H&M, there you go. Yeah. They're a very indie playlist. But there's different revenues, finding how that is. Like with, with Palette Knife, we work with a company called VNYL, who does like vinyl subscription service. And this was their first album. I was very debating, like, do we do vinyl for this? But I knew someone at the company, send the album, pitch it to him. He knew the label, and they bought like 1,200 vinyl up front, and we're like, all right, that's cool. We can do 2,000 units. Let's work with Palette Knife on this vinyl. Let's create this branding, and there were like color scheme, and like do this whole big thing. And it's because we found a champion at a different, like whole different revenue stream that normally most small bands don't have that opportunity to go through. When it comes to finding the bands, so you, you, you've got one, they found you, you found them, you have the discussion. What, what do terms look like? Is it for a set period of time? Do you do it by a set amount of songs, albums? What, what's the sort of the modern look at it? It's, we, have, we have bands, we have song deals where it's you know, 20 songs. We have bands that are two LPs, one LP and an EP, which is essentially, you know, five, like five songs. But, uh, you know, like even like to be transparent, like with Snarls, we had a deal that was pretty fake. Like we had a plan for Snarls of how to do it. And we brought in a management person and an agent and a lawyer and, ha and the band did great. And they blew up and they're like, hey, uh, can we get a better deal? You're, 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 you know, this is, and I'm pretty passive. I'm like, you're right. You, you do to get a better deal. Let's renegotiate this deal. Let's because there's money to be made. I don't need. I'm not going to stick to this deal. That's you know just like a developing act deal. Like let's change it. Let's make it work for everyone so you can go and do this as maybe a career. Um, question. Um, it was just about the like the amount of money up front, really. That the, and they because they had. At the start of 2020, they had you know three tours and a European tour booked, and before everything got canceled, they needed this, and they're like, hey, can we get more money? How do we make this work? Because, you know, someone's dad's not going to front 10, 15 grand for a van, and as a label, you know, that's something that we need to do, and because of not even their success at the time, it was the hope of future success and the plans that we had in the future where. I will go in and say, hey, we need to make, we need to give you this m amount of money up front. Let's make it fair. Let's work, you know, ev most everything we do is a 50-50 net profit split. So I don't make money until the band makes money. Not every label is like that. Yeah. And the same thing with merchandising. So like if, you know, we're paying $5 to make that shirt and Palette Knife selling for $15, we're both making $5. And the same thing with a record, but with records, there's recording costs or um, producers. There's also um, art fees, distribution fees, lots of different things that go into that process until, as a label, we make money. That's a good question, though. Well, sort of on that, when it comes to like rights and royalties, how is your deals typically structured? Are they individualized, or do you do this as sort of a you know, sort of how you do it for everybody is one size fits all. There's definitely not one size fits all because some bands are more of a risk than others. Some bands I just sign because I like them. I'm like, you're, they're never gonna make a ton of money. They may never even break even, but like, I love this band, I wanna do this record. If their expectations are at the same level mine are, then we can make something happen because we both, they wanna create music, I wanna promote music, and we can like, all right, this is gonna be okay. It's never going to be great because you're, you know, you're working 40 hours a week. You're not going to leave that job at 28 years old to, to risk it all. And I, I'm okay with that. If we have these same expectations, we can develop the art and build it in a way that, you know, you can play 
30 shows a year and hopefully draw in a regional area or a local area. Now, every, your definition of success is, will vary from every person in the room. That's, uh, that's exactly what I just wrote down, was levels of success. So when it comes to that, it is very different because some bands, their level of success is they won't find that until they are 21 pilots. Others may find it when they're able to tour regionally, or some may find it as writers because somebody now is playing their songs. So how does that play into when you're looking at, besides a, a pet project, something that's near and dear to your heart, how does that play into decisions when you're looking at an artist and the potential future success of them commercially on your end? Yeah, so when I get any type of music, I will text multiple friends in the industry or just friends that I trust their opinion. Like, hey, I really like this song. What do you think of it? Am I crazy or is this freaking great? Go, like, all right, if X people say it's good, like, hey, hey, Mr. Agent guy, hey, Mr. Manager guy, hey, Mr. Lawyer guy, I'm already doing the behind the scenes work before we're even talking to that band. And then once I get this consensus feeling like, all right, this is going to be really hot or something that we can work with and build a team around or some type of branding or some type of just uh, a music culture behind, then I'll approach the band and have this plan kind of either planned out or, you know, have hopes of it. You know, you can't, I don't want to commit. You never want to overpromise and under deliver too. It's absolutely horrible and devastating for not only the label, but for the band, because you're, you know, as a label, as a manager in the music, you're also a psychiatrist. Ser yeah. <laughs> e egos fluctuate on every level, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, you know, you always have to think about what are the do's and the don'ts. What are the things that get them recognized with you, and what are the things that turn you off to a band immediately? Like, what are the things that you see that right away sort of, wow, I like these guys, I want to know more, and what are the things when you hear a band and you're just like, no, that never is going to work for me? The way they treat other people. If you, you need to treat, like, if you're treating the sound guy as, you know, if you think you're better than the sound guy or this intern here or anyone, like, you need to treat everyone equally, and if you have this outlook where everyone's important. You know, I, I feel the same way. I think we were talking about this the other day at the bar. You know, high school kids will come and like they'll email me like, "Hey, can I get a photo pass for my high school newspaper?" I'll email them back, and if I can make that happen, I will. Because that 15-year-old kid could be a 20-year-old kid in college, who could be working at the radio station, who could be next to could be interning at NPR, or Pitchfork, or another. You never know what that person is going to be, and you want to cultivate that at a young age. You want to cultivate that just in the industry itself. You don't know who that person is going to be, and you want to treat them equally. So talent aside, attitude yeah. carries a lot attitude. of weight. 100%, yeah. Okay, all right, well, that's, that's always good to know. I think that that, you know, I, in the other, you know, uh, session earlier, I think all three of the booking agents all mentioned that as well, that how you deal with the people that you're talking with, from the sound guy to the door guy to the bartender, matters a lot, because they're gonna remember that, and you know, if you were a shit bag first time, they may not have you back the next yeah. time. Fair enough. Um, okay, so you do all the right things, you have the right sound, and they still can't break through. How, do, how does a band stand out? Because they are one of 500 that has that sort of sound, and they may be better, but they don't have something unique. But they, they have the worth, and they have the value, and they do all the right things. They practice, they're, they're good at their craft, but they just can't seem to make that next step. How do they find that success? I wish I had that answer. <laughs> that, that's, that's a great question. But, uh, I mean, if we're doing everything we can, both the artist, I mean, it's also the artist needs to work as hard as the label does. It's a push and pull situation. Um, I am just your advocate for trying to find new people to listen to your music. If you're not promoting your own music, like we're talking about social media, if you're not actively posting, if you're not looking for the friends in those bands, or like trying to develop like open, you know, open for bigger acts here, or just trying to go regionally, or actually touring at all. You know, they're talking about like find a band in Kansas, trade them a show 
in Columbus. I'm not sure how far Kansas is from here, but far. Far, okay. Maybe not Kansas. Maybe Chicago. Chicago, Detroit. Sure. You know, do a weekender with, with you know, a band that you find equally um, as big, if not bigger, and try to develop fan bases in other areas. Yes? I agree, yeah, and some and different members of each band have a different voice. Um, social media wise, if one band person posts all the time, you're gonna have this singular voice. And that may be like it may be very boring and or you're not replying to fans or like whether it's Instagram or that, if, or someone's really funny and you're not letting them do that. I think switching jobs in bands is very important, especially when starting out, to see who is good at what. Um, not everyone wants to sit on Twitter for, you know, 20 minutes a day and interacting and joking about X, X, and X. But, it, you know, you can find fans that way. And, and also, like, expanding in business speak, like, horizontal. Like, what else do you love? Do you love video games? Do you love skateboarding? You know, the music intersects in so many different ways where you can find fans of, you know, like, the Palanite stuff. There's Cake Bender, the song you played. Big Air, you know, Avatar. It's like you can dive into those fans in video games. Like those people who play those games will hear these references and songs and you can go on any type of like social media or Instagram and you can jab and, you know, talk with them as much as you can about the stuff that you both enjoy that's not music, but they will immediately gravitate towards your band because they have this personal interaction that's not about music, which inherently will make them like your music more. And that's important. Questions? Go ahead. Hi, Joe. <laughs> um, so as someone who, you know, has worked with you before, um, I, I feel like a lot of people can benefit from the, uh, from the anecdotes that you would make about what a relationship is like with you in a band. Um, I feel like a lot of artists, a lot of band is, bands probably have a a fetishism about what getting signed looks like and you know what that actually does when in reality it's very much a push and pull kind of situation of making sure that it's working for both parties. Uh, I, th I just want to hear kind of what you have to say about a realistic look at what an indie band or sorry an indie labels relationship with a band or artist looks like as opposed to someone's glorified thoughts about what labels actually do for an artist, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, with me, I'm pretty personal. Like, I, I'm in Cleveland. I hang out with my bands. Uh, I hang, hung out with Pal and Knife last night. Anytime I've been in Cleveland, I hang out with, like, the Bravo Artist people are great friends of mine. I stay at Alex from Bra uh, Bravo Artist's house and just develop these relationships because you want to develop relationships, but you also want to be with people who are good people. Uh, I think that's very important to be able to separate that. But, you know, we signed Sonderbombs, and it was the plan to get them on the road, like they're on the road right now, um, and to develop them into an artist that can make money on the road was, you know, a year and a half down the road, 18 months before you were doing tours that were playing 100 people a night. Maybe? I'm not sure. Cappy? When, how was it? That was a Just Friends tour, was what, 2019? So, so like, yeah, so it's about 12, 18 months from the release of the first album before you're doing, there's a couple shows here and there, like you play Cleveland, you did a couple, bene like, a couple benefit things, but the realistic expectation is once you sign to label, it's like everything's going to happen. It is the opposite. It's like this is when things can happen. So you need to work harder in with that label. Yeah. And money, and you know, we got to, you got to pick the next record, you got to pick your producer that you want to work with, and you, and you said, Joe, write us a check. And I, and, I, and I did. So, you know, you get to that, and that's because we worked so hard on the first record and promoting it, that the next thing they do, and they want to work with this producer, they want to do all this stuff, like we went to Australia and we said, 
hey, we need to get this label in Australia to put out this, the Sonderbombs album there and find a team. Or like, and then UK Europe came by and like, hey, we wanted the Sonderbombs UK and Europe. We had a reason to go and expand the brand of the band and where they work digitally, physically. And, you know, they're, go they're going to UK Europe next uh, June. Yeah. So just like understanding, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a, pan, a pandemic panic button. So, like, we need something to do here. And, like, the same thing with the Snarls EP that comes out in a couple weeks. That was me sitting with a manager in Cleveland in the band, and we are like, all this touring's killed us for 18 months. What do we do? Let's do another album. And I, we're like, who do you want to produce it? And... Uh, and the band, I think, said Chris Walla. Chris Walla did, like, Death Cab, Tegan, for, Tegan and Sarah. Um, he played in Death Cab. And I was emailed him at, like, 5 in the morning after hanging out with everybody. And he got back to me, and we just made it happen. And it was just, like, luck, not skill, or I did not know him. But we had an idea. Like, if we get someone really cool to do something with that band, we'll add something to our... That album wasn't even the record deal. Right? Let's add it. Let's be fiscally responsible, put it out, and hopefully there's touring in 2021 in the fall, which right now there is. You know, they start their tour next week. And yeah, it's half sold out, which is great. And they're touring with another one of my band's mags from LA. And their first date was yesterday, and they've already had problems, and so I'm fixing that. And that's, it's, it's, that's what it is. First, first tour back is not everyone's gonna be prepared. And as a label, you need to be able to come in and fix the problems, mostly financially. I'm going to go back to uh, a second ago. We were talking a little bit about social media and using Instagram and stuff of those natures. So as the label, how much control do you exert over the band when it comes to their persona and their social media presence? Because, you know, as you've seen recently and not so recently, some people make big mistakes and create a lot of problems for themselves through social media. So how do you manage that or do you control it? Or at what degree and level do, again, as a label, where is your control mechanisms? Uh, we have zero creative control in like any of the songs of, some bands will come and ask me questions about demos, how to market stuff. But like ultimately, it's this is your band. I can tell you, if we do, like picking a first single, it is that's the hardest thing to do with a band. If there's like three songs, like how do you do it? And that's like, all right, well we're gonna have a budget for one music video. What's the song? And there is a internal battle with the band. Then if if that's the opposite of the song I want, then there's a, a battle with me or an agent or a manager. And like, how do you pick this? How do you roll it out? And but it's the band's final decision. Uh, I can just tell you, like, I don't, I'm going to be transparent, like, I don't like that choice. It would be better. We're going to roll with it and try as hard as we can with this way, but this is why I want to do it that way. Um, more often than not, it's a, a pretty good, you know, a pretty good agreement on, like, what, what you want to do, but sometimes there's that tough decision that the band makes and they want to stick with what they want to do, and that's, that's up to them. Okay, well that's interesting. You know, a lot of times the, you know, in the days gone by, the record labels exerted a lot of control yeah. over bands, whether it was a, you know, major label or independent on what is their single, what's that release when it is, as well as a lot of control over, um, you know, contractual obligations and a lot of their social media and how they present themselves. Well, when it is, I will control. Because we need a tour, most usually. And then we also have other bands on the label that it's one thing to be, uh, to pick your song and how you want to do it and your album art. But when you're messing with the times of other artists, that's when I need to kind of come in and say, hey, we have this, this, this stuff in January is all set. We can't do it in January. It's already set. This artist has this plan. We're not going to move anything for you. I'm sorry. That's when I'll come in and say, like, you can't affect 
other people. If it's just affecting yourself, then that's okay to make your own artist decision. Fair enough. Go ahead. So radio more often reaches out to us, weirdly. And, and if we know an artist, like we'll send the stuff to all the locals, every band like CDC, Columbus Alive, um, we go to Cleveland Scene, all that stuff for our local artists. But we'll go, we work with NPR pretty well with playlisting on Spotify, and that will generate stuff like with KEXP, which is in Seattle. And then uh, what's, that? what's the huge LA one? K-Rock? Karak is like, good luck. But sometimes they'll play a single, and then Triple J over in Australia will play some stuff. And that's and once one of those larger stations picks it up, other people will see it, and it, it just comes down. We also work with, uh, they were out of Massachusetts. Uh, I'm trying to think, they're co mostly a college radio pusher, but as far as like going, like any singles, like real radio, that's tons of money, and I don't think we have too many bands that are doing that. I think it's very important. But so that a lot of the legwork can be done by either the bands or me or like a publicist. But we don't really do too much like specialty like radio stuff in every region. Well, I think what he was saying is a lot of times um, certain radio stations can be kingmakers. Yeah. Like a Triple J in Australia is well known in the industry that because that's the only sort of alternative in Australia. If you get on Triple J, people know you. Oh wow, they're played there. Or it used to be you know BOS in Boston. You know, back in the day, or you know, ninety, uh, no, ninety-seven X to X Y used to be well known because they were a, a indie breaking band. Um, you know, we sort of have a reputation like that now, where it's thirty yeah. years later. Um, but that's there are sort of the kingmaker radio stations that that have some control over what happens once they sort of get played. They go, oh, and they can sort of hang their hat on that. So, and you know, we, do, we seek out artists. Um, and that, that comes to us from lots of places. You could be, for instance, hey, here, check out this band as a listener. Or, you know, a record label may come to us and say, hey, here's a new artist I signed, you can check them out. So that, that does come at, from every direction, so. Yeah, and a lot of radio stations, like you're doing some live sessions mm -hmm. too, and you're building, you know, the, the visual of it, the, your YouTube channel, like KXP does something big. Mm -hmm. Audio Tree in Chicago is doing stuff where they're doing shows now. Right. Nate over there. So it's like, all right, well, you're going to play Audio Tree in Chicago, which has thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers on mm -hmm. YouTube. You'll do that cool session. You'll play Chicago. We'll promote it. And there's like different ways. And as a label, like, I see all these people. And it, just because you sign to us doesn't mean you'll get it, but we know how to get you heard by them. I saw some. How do you decide as far as releasing music goes? Like, what is working best? Especially, like, in 2021, where streaming is big, like, as far as, like, do you release, like, single after single, or is it an EP? Or do you release a full album? So, it's so, it's so different. Like, you, like, the rule of thumb now is, like, if you can do singles, do singles. But we're in the indie, like, punk, like, indie punk like alternative world, if we're able to get press, which is hard to find, find these champions, like we'll go to Snarls, like we knew Rolling Stone was coming, NPR, MTV, you get that, like we need to do a full album, we can't do singles because people are gonna read about it and they're gonna wanna be able to buy something immediately. So we need something to let, you know, stand the test of time, like here's this piece of art, we like, we asked them like, hey, this is gonna be cool, like what do you wanna do with vinyl, what do we wanna do with the art, how do you want to build that whole thing? And if we can find these champions at press, like these huge press places, then we'll do a whole album. Single-wise, it's more, can we get five Spotify playlists? And if we don't get it, it's like, let's go back to the well for the next three weeks. And if nothing hits, like you're a single, it's how many, you know, no one's going to listen to it. Then maybe you do another one, or maybe you do an EP. You know, get maybe a string of songs, like how, how strong is that song? Where does it fit? Where does it fit with the band style? Because some bands will write a song that their genres will flip. And this band who has five songs that everyone loves throws a curveball in the sixth song and you don't know what to do with it. And it flops monetarily, but maybe it's best for the band that that's the genre they're going to, but their previous fans are kind of pulling out. 
it's very different. Yeah. So each, each song on digital services has an ISRC code that sticks with it. So you can't re-pitch songs to streaming services. It will show up the same way. And that's like the same stuff that flags like your YouTube content, your SoundCloud content, you know. So you kind of get one shot at these larger playlist worlds. That's why people want to do these singles every three, four weeks, like in the, in the, pop, in the pop world and just see what sticks and build it up into something bigger or just pivot, be able to pivot. Now that was something that he just mentioned that I don't know uh, some of the people in bands aren't aware of, but that ISCR code is something that we deal with as well. That's how royalties are doled out, so that they know it's a specific code that is that song. So it's the same way Shazam knows it, as it is as Spotify knows it, as is Bandcamp knows it, as every streaming service knows it. So that's something again that is, I imagine that's what you as a label helps them create and get through those hurdles of that. Yes, Ex exactly. Yeah. Or, sure. Yeah. So uh, you said something about releasing singles one at a time. Me and my band are at the point where we just recorded a full length and contribute it to somebody. We think it's really impressive, but we don't want to waste the album. We're thinking about doing single, single, single all the way to the end and then releasing the album, but we don't want to waste it because we also know that with every single, there has to be making it more visible, visible on multiple, just not one like avenue, but multiple social media platforms. So yeah. how is it, I guess, more worth it to make it like a longer release when you have to pay more money? You know, how do you, how do you get the money back, I guess? <laughs> how do you get the money? Is it, is it your very first album and you have no other music online? I, I mean, if it's your first album, you sometimes might just want to get it out there so people have something to listen to and just develop from there. And then your next move will be, you know, you'll know what to do. It'll be indicative of how that performs. And you can, you know, when you, you can look at streaming numbers, and I look at streaming numbers all the time. We have bands that have hundreds of monthly listeners. We have bands that have millions of monthly listeners. Ultimately, that doesn't really matter to me on how much I like the music, but how you develop the business of the band, it, it does. So I would, you know, if it's your second album and it's already recorded, so many things you can do with it. I mean, you can shop it around. You could go with the singles. You could build videos for everything. Like, how interconnected is it? Are there songs that talk about certain subjects that are topical right now? You know? Like, is there, like... You know, if there's an election song, it's an election year, you know, tie it tied into that. Or it's a skateboarding song, like here's a, you know, what do you, you know, where can you find, other than the music, where else can you connect people to, you in the band, and what you truly like. You don't want to be fake, because people will sense a band that is fake. You know, you need to look like at yourselves and at your band and what you like to do. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm, I like wrestling. So if you think of a wrestler, the best wrestling characters like Stone Cold Steve Austin are their, their persona turned up to like 12. So you take what you like and just build it into something bigger. And, the mu and the, obviously you have good music, that's gonna help. But in promoting your music, that's how you, you're honest and how you, how you wanna build that, at least in my like, perspective. Anybody else have any other questions? You want to just get start wrapping it up. Uh, respect everyone's time. It's the after nine. We do this for about two hours. Going, going. All right. Um, well, that was Joe Urban. Obviously, if you guys want to have some other questions for Joe. What's that? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm sure Joe's going to hang around a little bit if you have some yeah. questions and you can bug him about getting signed. I want to thank you guys for coming tonight uh, for the first Music Monday of 2021 post-pandemic.
Um, we're going to be doing these regularly. Please remember the QR code so you can sign up, so you can get all the alerts for when things are happening, so you can sign up for when the next one's going to be coming. Also remember, we're going to be doing the Unheard, which is going to be a free music, a free music series that's going to happen at the big room, and that's going to happen on Sundays in the afternoon. That's going to be for unsigned bands, bands that may never have been heard, high school kids, garage bands, doesn't matter. We want to sort of give the opportunity to some of these bands that may have not gotten a chance to play yet or been afraid to or no one's ever said, hey, you should be a band. So remember that. Also, again, please give it up for Joe Irwin, for Hallett Knife and for the other people that were here tonight. Thank you guys very much. On behalf of the Music Commission, that's a wrap.